I think it's because she had came and did the Zoom. All right, thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you. Thanks for your patience as we're working on some clicker issues. If you are here for tobacco and vaping harm reduction in the Latinx community using a macro social work perspective, you are in the right spot. So welcome, we're so glad you're here. And we'll do clicky. <laughs> Today's agenda. Today's agenda, we're going to do introductions, talk a little bit about what is macro social work, the WHLTPN programs, statistics and zoning or ordinances here in Milwaukee County, resources, and then we'll finish up with a Q&A. Uh, when we do Q&A, Q &A, if you could just raise your hand and then our wonderful person, will uh, Gloria, will come to you with a microphone because we want to make sure all of our Zoom friends can hear you. All right, so who am I? I'm Lucy Staudiker. I am the uh, Associate Professor of Social Work here at Alverno College. I am the BSW Practicum Director. What does that mean? That means I help our students find their final social work senior practicum internship. And then right now, I'm currently also the chair of the program. Before that, my previous life, I am a clinical social worker, and I've been in clinical ther doing clinical therapy for over 30 years. I know, can you believe it? <laughs> My uh, co-presenter today is Ms. Alia Torres. She is a wonderful social work student. She graduated here at Alverno with her BSW, Bachelor of Social Work, and she's currently a Master's of Social Work student. Uh, she currently works at UMOS, and she will be telling you all about her amazing program and things that she runs at UMOS. All right, so a little bit about macro social work. So when I first started here at Alverno in 2018, um, I had the opportunity to think about teaching a macro social work. And I was like, yes, please, I want to do that. Because I'm really excited. I'm really excited about communities, organizations, advocacy, completing needs assessments, you know, getting in there and doing that bigger work instead of the one-on-one -on -one and the groups, which is wonderful. But I really like getting out and doing like that big community piece. Uh, policy work, political work, um, thinking about how policy Policies impact our clients, and also it impacts us as and what we do as social workers. You know, I also think about macro social work as a way in the field that we, you know, for a manager or a supervisor, we might have to write reports, uh, we might need to lead a team, we might need to write grants. Like that's all cool macro social work things, um, and I got really excited that I was able to uh, work on something like that. All right, so I'm working on my macro social work class, 2018, and then. Uh-oh, here's what I'm finding out as I do my research. Statistics from 20, 2008, and I'm sorry, that's the most recent I can find, um, is that macro social work has become a marginalized subfield of social work. Yikes. That's really depressing, and that's really sad. Um, so I thought, OK, what can I do about that? Problem two, statistics from 2013 show that considerable faculty resistance to the integration of macro social work, along with a general lack of interest from students. Okay, this just got even more depressing and more shocking. So I thought, you know, I don't know if students maybe understand or realize what macro social work is and the changes we can make in people's lives in macro social work. So what can I do different? Um, Lucy, hold on one second. Yes. It's, I think we're muted, and I don't think it's showing our presentation to them. OK, a little tech issue. Pause. We're unmuted now. <laughs> It says the host is disabled participant share screening. I don't know. I didn't. Thanks for your patience. So they might have to. Okay. Um. Oh, that's. I don't know what that is. Looks super psychedelic. 
Okay, if you want to relaunch or whatever. Oh, they could still hear me and see me. Ugh. Thank goodness. I thought, have I been talking and no one hears me at all? <laughs> Awesome. So, you know, right away, I'm thinking of solutions, right? You're a good social worker. You're thinking about, here's these problems. What can I do to, so, to come up with some solutions? So I dedicated an entire course about macro social work. What is it? What's the importance of it? What's the relevance of it? Uh, number two, guest speakers. You know, I really wanted to bring in people from the community and talk about what is macro social work, what do they do, how do they get satisfaction, and and uh, you know talk about what they actually do out in the field. And I've increased the students who have their final practicum, their final internship, and have them be macro social work focused instead of just one on one or group and family. Um, and then lastly, I started a student club to talk about social work. So you might see on our, on our slides some pictures of guest speakers and uh, our student club that we were working, that we have done. So that was my way to get things going on macro social work. The very cool thing was I had a student, Aliyah, who is very interested in macro social work and uh, had a lot of passion f about tobacco and vaping and how it was impacting specifically the Latinx community. And uh, when she graduated, she had a, she found a great job in uh, at UMOS and is making a significant difference in the community. And I'd love to introduce her and bring her up right now. So Aaliyah, take it away. Is this your slide or is this mine? We'll just move on. Okay. Oh my lord. You know, I really like this clicker today. Yeah, I'm not feeling the clicker. I'm not feeling the clicker. Hello guys, girls. I always get nervous to present, so don't mind me. Um, so today I'm just going to kind of go over my program and kind of like what is vaping, the dangers of vaping, and then what we do to try to prevent that in the community, not only for like the Latinx population, but also um, a lot of youth. So who we are, um, UMOS, which is United Migrant Opportunity Services, they house our program, which is called the Wisconsin Hispanic Latinx Tobacco Prevention Network. It's mouthful, so we just say WHLTPN for short. Um, so we work to educate and advocate for um, our community, and we educate um, local and state leaders, as well as um, we try to go out into schools and let them know the current policies and, you know, see if their tobacco um, smoke-free policy aligns with vaping because a lot of them don't. Um, they just kind of include the old products and not so much the new stuff. Um, and our vision is to have a healthy Hispanic community free from commercial tobacco products. And our mission is to, man, yeah, be free from commercial tobacco and nicotine. Yeah, it's not working that good. Hey, this one's not working. There we go. Okay, so what is vaping? Um, so vaping is basically inhaling an aerosol using an e-cigarette or a smaller device. Um, in most devising, devices, puffing activates the heating component. So it vaporizes the liquid that's in there um, or the oil. And then you inhale it and exhale it. Um, the term vaping is misleading because these devices don't produce pure water vapor. The aerosol consists of a lot of different chemicals and fine particles that are toxic and dangerous to be inside of your bloodstream. Um, so they have things such as um, acetone, which is what you find in nail polish remover, uh, battery acid. Um, they also have some chemicals from bombing fluid in there, so a whole bunch of stuff that you should not be inhaling. Um, and then there's a, a few different devices that I'm going to be talking about. So there's different generations of them. So the first generation is the, they're called Sigalikes. So they look like a cigarette um, and they have like a little red glow at the end. Um, the latest versions offer the capability to recharge them and reuse them, kind of like most vapes. The second generation offers longer battery life and ability to use different flavored liquids of your choice. The third generation, they're called mods, so they kind of look like a little walkie-talkie. 
and have benefit of longer battery charge and you can customize different parts of it. So you can like add stuff onto it, take it off. Um, and then the fourth generation products are pod based. So they look like flash drives. So some of these are what kids are taking into school and you know people don't really realize what they are because they look like flash drives. Um, there's also some that look like highlighters too. And then this one is very shocking. So in this slide, um, that vape, it's a popular one called Escobar. This one, we are actually working right now to get them banned from selling. So if a vape shop has them in stock right now, they can get fined because they're not supposed to be selling them anymore. So one of those vapes contain 5,000 puffs. So smoking one of those is equivalent to smoking 25 packs of cigarettes. And there's a lot of teenagers that I know that you know could go through one of those in a couple days. So that's like smoking 25 packs of cigarettes in a couple days. Um, there are four different kinds of e-liquids most commonly used for vaping. So there's more than 15,500 flavored e-liquids that are appealing to kids. Um, they have flavors such as cotton candy, grape, uh, blue raspberry, anything you could think of. Um, flavored e-liquids contain different amounts of nicotine. So some of them can carry 5,000 puffs, some of them can carry 2,000 puffs. It just all depends on which brand you're getting. Um, they contain vitamins and essential oils like B12 and melatonin. And at least 20 companies promoting uh, vapable vitamins that have caffeine, melatonin, and essential oils as well as wellness products. Then um, the marijuana can also be vaped in a dry leaf or wax. Um, so, you know, they also look like little vapes and the cartridges are the same. So, majority of cigarette companies have big stakes. So, most of them um, already have a popular vape brand because they seen we're losing money, nobody's smoking cigarettes anymore. Let's jump on the vape bandwagon. So, they're targeting a specific age group that they've traditionally relied on. So, like teens and young adults. Um, and we've noticed even the older generation who would smoke cigarettes, they're even now using these vapes just because the flavors are good. So, they don't have to have the same nasty nicotine flavor, you know. They can go smoke their blue razzleberry and go on with their day. Um, they're also helping, um, you know, the future market for cigarettes by addicting young people to nicotine through vapes. Um, they benefit as these same kids switch from cigarette smoking or they use like both products together. Then this kind of just shows the similarities from the way they would, um, well, the tobacco industry targets, so with cigarettes to vapes now. So in some cases, between cigarettes and e-cigarettes, ads are remarkable. In each of these panels, um, the image on the left is a classic cigarette ad, while the image on the right is a comparable ad for a vaping product. And they did, for cigarette ads, um, years and years, use celebrity and spokespeople, you know, people that attract young people. Um, they try to make it seem like it's good. And most of the ads, they're saying, you know, these make you feel better. These make you feel good. Have a good time. So, you know, people are obviously going to want to lean towards them because they're making them seem good, but not telling them about the bad of it. Um, these are some examples of vaping products with kid-friendly designs. So they come in a wide variety, um, very child-friendly flavors, and they're often packaged to resemble well-known candy products. So, you know, we have a lot of cases, I wish I would have brought my displays that I brought, but a lot of these look like candy that kids are eating. They'll even use the same picturing, they'll just change the name. So for example, you guys are familiar, I'm sure, with Pop-Tarts. So I had went shopping to see some stuff that I can compare to each other and they had refillable things, they're called pop cones, the exact same label as Pop-Tarts, but they're the little, wraps that you can like stuff stuff in so that was shocking to me just to see how similar that they're making these products look and even though they're not supposed to be selling to anyone anyone under 21 that's who they're specifically targeting is that age group under 21. Um, so why are these flavors so important? They mask the harsh taste of nicotine and other chemicals, making it easier to inhale the aerosol, and they have sweet, fun flavors that appeal to kids, and they assume that they're less harmful because of the flavoring. 
So on this one, I have one side for cigarette smoking and one side for vaping. So on the left is the cigarette smoking. Um, at this point, given our knowledge, e-cigarettes may be less harmful than regular cigarettes because they don't burn tobacco, which accounts for much of the health risks of smoking, but that doesn't mean there aren't any health risks. Um, there's just not enough information yet on vapes to where we can say that they're less or more harmful. Um, and then on the right, um, for vaping, so many young people think that vaping products uh, produces clouds of water droplets, but that isn't accurate. It's more like an aerosol from a hairspray because of all the chemicals that are in there. And although the chemicals have not, um, that have been found in e-cigarette aerosols might seem unrecognizable, you could be, you know, familiar with some of these. Um, so, for example, like I said, um, the, I might pronounce this wrong, but propylene glycol um, can be found in antifreeze products or in substances used to winterize like plumbing systems. Acetone, like I said, is found in nail polish remover or paint thinner. Um, oh my god. The ethyl benzene, um, which is often used to make other chemicals, it's also found in pesticides, synthetic rubber. So just a lot of these, the Ruby Diem is a chemical that can be found um, to give fireworks their bright colors. That's also another chemical that's in vapes. I mean, me personally, don't take my word for it, but vapes are way more um, worse than cigarettes because of all the chemicals. I mean, they're both bad, but if I had to choose one, I'd lean more towards the vapes. But um, even if vaping is not quite as harmful as cigarettes, there is still reason for concern. So it's increasing in the youth trend, which is troublesome because um, despite what people think, nicotine itself is harmful. The chemicals used in e-liquids are highly concentrated and very dangerous when they're inhaled. Vaping makes the transition um, to smoking cigarettes easier and quadruples the likelihood that a teen will take up cigarette smoking. Some of this information is not up to date because again it's hard to find information on vaping um, as it is getting more and more popular so we're hoping as time comes we have more up-to-date information so I'm not up here just telling you guys like this is what I think um, but you know actual information um, many teens and adults who vape are dual users so that means they'll use vaping and smoking cigarettes or like vaping and smoking marijuana um, so it's not really just one or the other they're kind of using both and vaping is associated not only with cigarette smoking, but other substances as well. Um, and it's also associated with, um, you know, a bunch of mental health problems, kind of. You know, we've just heard that a lot of people use them for stress, um, and that's why we hear a lot of teens using them. Um, they say it helps them with stress, but, you know, they don't see the after effects of that. Um, many people wonder whether nicotine is all that harmful. It isn't preferable to have people become addicted to nicotine um, as long as they're not inhaling and exhaling deadly tobacco smoke, right? But nicotine is highly addictive, especially risky for a developing teen, bread, uh, teen brain, no matter what form it comes in. Younger users are more likely to become addicted and have more difficulty quitting and are at higher risk to become addicted to other substances in the future because... They're going to be like, you know, well, this isn't giving me a high anymore, so I need something stronger. Uh, using nicotine in adolescence can harm parts of the brain that control attention, learning, mood, and impulse control. So I currently work with a youth group, and a lot of them come and give me feedback, you know, that there's kids using in the classroom, and if they can't use it in the classroom, they'll go and take a break because they just crave that, like they need to have it. Um... So, you know, that's interfering also with their class time, and a lot of teachers are having problems with them being in schools. Um, nicotine is a potent stimulant and increases adrenaline, raises blood pressure, speeds up the heart rate, and causes the arteries to narrow. So, you know, people who are in sports definitely stay away from them, um, which is what we definitely try to tell our youth just because they don't see the effects that it can have. You know, you could be out in track running, and if you're using these vapes, you can collapse and... Yeah, um, and it also causes respiratory uh, damage and has a negative effect on the reproductive organs. The adolescent brain reacts differently to nicotine than the adult brain does. Um, so long-term nicotine vaping can reduce attention span and affect other abilities needed for learning in school. 
um, teens experience enhanced locomotor activities, so like walking, running, jumping. Um, they're more likely to find the vaping experience to be rewarding with fewer withdrawal symptoms than adults, obviously because they have way more energy than us. I mean, I'm to only 25, but I feel like I'm getting up there. I just am so tired all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, they have the more energy to so are like, oh, yeah, I can hit this all the time and, you know, keep on going. But eventually it will catch up to you. Um, and the longer you use it, especially if they're using, like, that 5,000 puff one, like I said, they don't realize that that's, like, using 25 packs of cigarettes. So just imagine if they're going through maybe, like, three of those in a week. Their lungs are not going to be doing so good within a month or so. Um, so nicotine addiction can happen swiftly and is extremely hard to get rid of. So think about how hard it is for an adult smoker to quit. So nearly 70% of adult smokers say they want to quit, and there's more than slightly 7% who actually succeed. Um, vaping is more addictive than smoking because of the higher doses of nicotine and because of the concentrated liquid. Um, is formed more quickly than the smoke is formed. And I say also because of the flavors, because, you know, they taste better than cigarettes, I'm sure. Um, so nicotine, like all drugs, changes the structure and the function of the brain. The receptors in the brain grab onto the nicotine molecule and, you know, take it and distracts you from your attention and learning. Um, and if there's a family of history or addiction or other family members are using substances like that, you know, a teenager's vul vulnerability increases because they see it. That's what they know. Um, so they're like, why can't I try it? You know, my parents have been doing it or my grandpa, grandma have been doing it. So let me try it, especially since I got the more fun ones around. Um, teenagers with anxiety or depression are also more likely to use them just because, like I said, they feel that it helps them kind of like relieve stress. Um, and then finally, the withdrawal symptoms are quite intense. So it most likely drives people who vape like right back to the product, even if they're really trying hard to quit. So you may have heard of the recent reports of vaping related um, serious lung disease, and even deaths throughout the country. So the symptoms include shortness of breath, unexplained weight loss, fatigue, and gastro gastrointestinal issues. So the spate of illnesses and deaths have been given a name by the CDC called EVALI. Um, the statistics as of February 2020 are that nearly 70 people have died and more than 2,800 have fallen ill from a vaping-related illness. Um, it kind of, from what I've heard, fills your lungs with fluid. And after a while, there's like so much that they can do to where people end up dying from it. Um, so, you know, it's newer. Um, I've been doing some research on it. It's very scary. Um, teenagers don't believe me that they can get it. They think I'm lying and just trying to scare them. But it's very scary. I've seen videos on TikTok of teenagers in the hospital with this and, you know, they'll be spitting up blood and everything. And I just don't think that people really see the causes um, or effects that it's doing to you until you're in that specific situation. So um, a Harvard study found that 76% of e-liquids analyzed contain diacetyl. So it's a food flavoring that gives popcorn, toffee, ice cream, and other products a buttery flavor. So I don't know if you guys were here last time when me and Lucy, um, what event was it, Lucy, that we, we served popcorn? Oh, we did a event. It was here. I don't, yes. I don't remember what it was. What was the name of it? I don't know. I have three kids, so my mom brain is sometimes like just. <laughs> I don't see that. Oh, there, there was a uh, mental health uh, awareness month event that um, Aaliyah and I were by the commons in Alverno mm -hmm. and we were giving out information, little handouts, goodies, things like that to really raise awareness. Uh, we had a great uh, students participating, uh, asking questions and even lots of, you know, it might not be me, but I'm concerned about my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my parent, uh, another loved one. So it was really a great like uh, community awareness event. 
Yes, so um, we were handing out popcorn because diacetyl is linked to something called popcorn lung. So um, it's a condition that was first identified among popcorn factory workers who inhaled this chemical while they were working there. Um, and it results from a form of bronchiolitis where the inhaled chemical scars your lung tissue, making it difficult to breathe. So this chemical was actually like killing people who worked in the factory making popcorn. So I'm not sure why they would decide to put it in vapes, right? But that's where we live for you. Um, the vaping industry has maintained the amount of diacetyl exposure from cigarette smoking is significantly higher um, than exposure from vaping, probably as much as 750 times higher. Um, despite this claim, we now have our first case of popcorn lung in a Canadian teen who had been vaping for only five months. Okay, so next, this is kind of what I do. Um, so Wisconsin Wins is a statewide campaign, um, obviously in Wisconsin, that uses science-based strategies to decrease youth access. Um, so the Wisconsin Department of Health Services con uh, contracts with local partners such as mine, and we conduct investigations which are compliance checks. We provide retailers with education and training as well as doing like social media outreach, community education. So I along, um, Myself with two teenagers aged 16 to 17 we will go out on like a Saturday and say we'll hit up like 30 retailers in the zip code like 53215. So I'll give them some cash and I'm like here go try to buy like a cigarillo or go try to buy a vape or go try to buy a pack of cigarettes. Um, or I'll, I'll tell them go buy whatever you want just come back come back out with a product if they can. So the whole point of that is we go in to make sure that they're checking IDs. So the whole point of us sending them in is to hope that they'll ask for their ID, they'll see that they're not 21 and won't sell to them, right? No, most of the time they're selling to them without checking IDs. Um, I have got feed like pushback too. I know one guy came running outside mad um, because if they sell to them, we have a police officer that comes with us. So they get a nice little fine of um, $700, you know, to tell them stop selling to these kids that are underage because that's how they're getting their hands on these products. If you wouldn't sell to them, you know, they wouldn't be able to use them. Um, and we get feedback like, oh, well, the legal law is 18 and, you know, the federal law hasn't passed yet for 21, but they're still under 18, so why are you selling to them? Oh, can you go back to that really quick, Lucy? Those in the middle um, are actually products that we have collected. So those are all of the products my youth were able to purchase. Um, we mainly try to get the cigarillos just because they're a little cheaper because we have to pull the money out of our grant. So a vape costs like $20. So I really would rather not spend $20 each time we go out, especially if they're going to be selling um, because I just have to hold on to them. So. So um, for year to date in, I'm going to move over here because I'm not going to lie. My vision is not the best. Um, so in 2022, so our calendar year is a little different. So our contract period goes from the beginning of July to the end of June. So this was for like 2022, 2023. So we had did 189 compliance checks and 52 retailers had sold to my youth. Um, that year was really rough for us just because my youth were in shock. Like I would ask them, how do you feel that, you know, they're selling these products to you? And they're like, it's crazy. They're not even checking our IDs. They don't care. Um, but they also thought it was kind of cool. Like, wow, they're not checking my ID. I was like, no, <laughs> don't get that idea, okay? <laughs> Then this one um, was for the current year, so 2023, 2024. We did 156 um, compliance checks, and 17. we only had 17 sell to us. So it did drop. Um, I don't know if one, because I keep using the same two youth, or two, they seen my youth on Fox 6 News talking about how he does the compliance <laughs> checks. Um, but either way, they are checking IDs now, so that's good. Maybe they got tired of getting a ticket. I don't know. <laughs> Um, this is fact. So it's Wisconsin's youth tobacco prevention. There's over 30 groups um, in Wisconsin besides mine. So, um, you know, it's teens that lead activism activities, um, initiatives. They do peer to peer advocacy. We meet um, once a month on a Friday. I buy them food because who doesn't love food? Um, they also get a gift card for coming because, you know, you have to give them some type of incentive. They're teenagers, they're not going to come for free. Um, 
but they love it. Um, we do a lot of activities. We do tobacco prevention activities that they could take back and do with their peers in school. So then their peers are also learning about it. And then, you know, I take them to do some little good incentives. I got um, somebody from the Milwaukee Admirals to get us free tickets for an Admirals game. And then I just purchased um, Brewers tickets for us through our grant as an incentive to tell them thank you. But they are very persistent teenagers. Like if you're looking for persistent teenagers, come talk to them. We were at the Brewers game and I kind of had to pull them back a little bit because they seen people smoking. <laughs> and they would go up to them and hold their sign in front of them like, stop smoking. And I was like, oh, let's walk away from them because <laughs> I don't want to have to, you know, get out of my character with you guys if they try to say something. Because um, they're like my children too. Um, we also got to meet with Representative Daniel Reamer. He had came last year and spent Valentine's Day with us and they told him all about the great work that they're doing. And then we had did a cigarette butt cleanup at South Shore Park and they were just overjoyed with the feedback they were getting from people that were stopping them telling them that what they were doing was great and they were just happy. They felt that they were doing something good in the community and that they were getting notice, uh, notice for it. And then this is a zoning ordinance that recently got passed last year in June. So um, the Milwaukee Common Council adopted this ordinance to kind of regulate the growth of smoke and vape shops in the city. Um, so this new ordinance prohibits a new vape shop or smoke shop. It has to have, I think, their floor has to be more than 15% of tobacco products to be considered for this. Um, but they can't open within 500 feet of an already existing retailer or within 1,000 feet of um, a school library park, so like where children predominantly are. Um, oh, yeah. It, um, applies to shops that have 10% or more. So my youth had testified in front of the Common Council and I was just so proud of them because they just tugged at my heartstrings with their testimonies. Um, they really didn't care what I had to say. Like by the time I went up there, they're like, just hurry up, we already heard your youth. Like we don't wanna hear no more. So I was like, okay, as long as I got to talk, I don't care. Um, but that's us with somebody from, I believe he's an elderman, I can't remember his name. Um, but yeah, that's us taking a picture there um, the day it got passed. And then this is a video, I might have to go back in camera to play it. This is the one where my youth was on Fox 6 talking about him doing the compliance checks. They like had grabbed him right when we finished testifying. And he's like, can I talk to you? And I was like, um, you can't talk to me because you most doesn't let me talk without getting it passed by them in case I say something wrong, you know? Don't want to get fired. Um, <laughs> so I just let him do the talking. Maybe I'll try it later. Okay, yeah. And then these are just resources I have in case anybody needs any resources. Melissa, should we try to show on that video? Mm -hmm. I think we have to exit. All right, so one second as we try to show that video uh, from Fox 6 of the youth right after the zoning ordinance was passed. Oh, no. Okay, here we go. Common Council Zoning Committee also talking about other issues, including vape shops, which seem to be just about everywhere in the city. Can you expand on what they were talking about? Yeah, Ted, and the interesting thing about the discussion in the zoning committee today is we heard from a number of high school students, students who that? actually said no, that yeah. this is a big problem, a growing problem. That has to be so weird. To do a little bit of volume? Yeah, just shake the button. This one? Oh. Oh, right here? Maybe that will do it. Maybe that might be too loud. That's okay. <laughs> Everybody's, whoa! Hey, you guys could for sure hear it now. <laughs> Council zoning committee also talking about other issues. Okay, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Council zoning committee also. Is that better? Not really. Kind of. Yeah. Okay. 
Common Council Zoning Committee also talking about other issues, including vape shops, which seem to be just about everywhere in the city. Can you expand on what they were talking about? Yeah, Ted, and the interesting thing about the discussion in the Zoning Committee today is we heard from a number of high school students who actually... All right. Ready? Common Council Zoning Committee also talking about other issues, including vape shops, which seem to be just about everywhere in the city. Can you expand on what they were talking about? Yeah, Ted, and the interesting thing about the discussion in the Zoning Committee today is we heard from a number of high school students who actually said that this is a big problem, a growing problem amongst high school students who really not legally able to smoke tobacco, but he says that they're going in. And actually, one of the young men, I want you to hear from him, he told me that he actually is part of the sting operations, working in coordination with Milwaukee Police Department, as well as some uh, activist groups in Milwaukee, going out to do sting operations on dealers, the tobacco dealers, to make sure they're not selling to him because he's only 17 years old. Listen to what he said. It wasn't really common back then when I was in middle school, but now that I'm a senior, I've seen it more and more, and it's become a big issue, especially for the younger kids that are now in middle school. They're using it more, and it's even going down to the elementary schools, which is a big problem. I don't like that. He's very persistent. He got right to the point within, like, seconds. <laughs> But yeah, that's all I have for you guys. If you guys have any questions for us. Yes. Okay. I think so. This, this, this. Um, just two quick questions. One, just um, thinking maybe, because I know you didn't like the idea of having to do the vape shops, but I feel because your presentation was represented about like vaping and stuff, would you think in maybe the near future, not all the time, but at least every once in a blue moon, having them try to do a vape so then at least you have some type of like, yeah, like they sold them this instead of like wraps and stuff like that. Yeah, um, we have bought a couple vapes, um, so like I try, we, let's see, I have to do 156 for my contract, like checks, so I kind of split it out between five months, so I try to at least buy one every time we go out, um, just not like for all of them, because if we're doing 30 stores, 30 times 20 is a lot of money, and yeah. we're grant funded, so. <laughs> yeah, and then my second question is maybe the thought of, I don't know how many you have of volunteers, but to kind of like, since some stores, like you said, like they know because he's been on there, like have you thought about like maybe rotating volunteers or like something along the lines just so that it's not like, well, I've seen you, so I'm yeah. definitely not going to. And then probably somebody else, as soon as he leaves, it's an underage person and he doesn't check. Yeah. So I definitely am switching them this year, actually. Um, one, because he's turned 18, so he can't do it anymore. Um, but two, it's I had um, other people before him, but one of their parents kind of got like iffy like they didn't know if it was safe or not we have a police officer come with us and i myself um and my mama there so i will never let nothing happen one time they called me and they were like they took our id the knowledge out i said i'm coming right now um so you know i had to hop in the store real quick but um we definitely are switching them it's just hard sometimes because like i said the parent had pulled them out because of a situation that you know, they felt their kid didn't feel safe, which that's fine. I completely get it. I'm a mom, too. Um, it's just hard to kind of try to get kids who want to do it because there's some, like, I live over there. Like, I'm going to be going to these stores, and then they're going to see me, and they're not going to want me in their store. I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Uh, so one of my questions was, um, have you had anybody still sell to them after they showed their ID? Because... Um, like I've had situations where I'm going to like a bar with some friends and there's a friend that's underage and they'd be like I'll throw you an extra 20 if you just let them in even after showing ID so I guess like have you any had situations like that because there are some people who are, would still do that yes we have um, there's this one guy and he asked my youth um, so if they ask them their age they have to be honest like I tell them you have to tell them your real age um, so he did he didn't ask for his ID, he said, I'm 16. Um, the guy was like, I'm gonna ask you again. What's your age? Yeah, um, but then when he got a ticket, he wanted to cry, and I'm like, what, what are you crying for? 
Like, you literally asked him what his age was again when he told you he was 16. So, yeah, we have had it happen. Um, it's unfortunate, but if we're being honest, they just see a dollar sign. They don't really care about anything else. Uh, so I had a quick question about the packaging. So obviously the packaging. A little closer to your mouth. Huh? I couldn't hear that. Facebook when someone's talking, just like anybody around them with a side conversation, the mic's picking it up. Okay. Um, I had a question about the packaging because obviously the packaging is like really bright, colorful. Sometimes it has fruits on it, and obviously the flavors themselves are very uh, enticing, and they you know they taste good, and the vapes don't taste like tar and tobacco. Mm -hmm. um, but I was curious if there's anything that you guys uh, are doing or can do to kind of, um, and I don't know if there's research about it yet or anything, but uh, about maybe. Uh, making the packaging say, you know, this product really clearly like contains nicotine and also maybe like just really big and then mm -hmm. decreasing the amount of colors and I guess it uh, excitingness of the packaging because I feel like that is definitely a big part of kids gravitating towards them and thinking that it's not that big of a deal. It won't kill me because mm -hmm. it's so fun and colorful and it tastes good. So I guess I was just curious about uh, that. Yeah, um, so right now, cause I'm on, well, through all of Wisconsin, I'm not the only one that's funded for tobacco. So we work with the tobacco prevention control policies. Um, so right now we're trying to get a policy passed how California does to where it's like banning all flavored products. Um, it's gonna be hard, but we're really trying to push because I think they already passed, um, which we just talked about this in a meeting a couple days ago, they already passed to ban um, certain vapes. So if a retailer's selling those vapes still, they are getting fined like $19,000 for having any of those products. Um, so we are working on that. I think they have a messaging on there, kind of how the, the cigarillo wrappers have, like from the Surgeon General, like this product contains chemicals that can cause cancer, um, but it's very small. So it's hard because they've been trying to pass the T21 law since 2019 and we still haven't passed it. Um, so it's just a lot of pushing. We were very happy when we got the uh, zoning ordinance passed because that happened within a couple months. So it's one step closer to getting that. But we're definitely trying to work on like getting all flavors banned just because that is what's mainly grabbing their attention. Um, I know you were saying there's not a lot of um, data yet just because there may not have been um, current research studies yet, um, but how are you finding that it's affecting the Latinx community in comparison to others? Is there any data on that? There is. Um, so I look at this website called Truth Initiative and the most recent data I found, which they try to update it, but I think they played me. It's from 2020, but it says 2024. I think they just created a new fact sheet. Um, but it talks about like how the Hispanic um, community is disproportionately like targeted by tobacco industries, like more than any others. Um, but I think in general, it's just like the, um, what am I trying to say? You know, people of color, if we're being honest, they're all disproportionately targeted, um, you know, Hispanics, blacks, we're we're all targeted. I know I work with a partner in Wisconsin, and she's um, from the Poverty Network, um, and she works on menthol and how menthol specifically targets the black community. So we don't have that much information, but um, I did create a survey with our epidemiologist um, from the program, and I launch it every year, so I do it from the time we start our contract to the time we end it, and I kind of take it and create it into a fact sheet to get like updated information for myself, even though it's just within Milwaukee, but it's still some data I can use just to show like how many people are currently using vapes. Because right now it's hard to find an exact number because a lot of people aren't updating the information or you know it's just hard for them to do the research. And from what they've told me, they updated every two years. So like the information that they'll launch in 2024 is actually from like 2022 or 2021. It just takes a long time to process. 
this just came to mind. Um, how does this compare cigarettes vaping to hookah use? Because I'm seeing that a lot now, like going to bars and it's like, oh, get this hookah for forty dollars, share between four people, and it's the same thing with flavors, and it's still the same type of inhalation, smoke, charcoal, all of that. So, I'm, if you know, but how does that compare? Um, I'm gonna try my best. Um, so I think hookah still falls under our category because the little charcoal things that they have contain some type of nicotine. Um, so there's actually a retailer that sold to us on 27th Street, I think, over here. Um, and they're opening up a bubble tea hookah lounge. And we're pushing right now. I'm working with elder woman Joe Cass's and Ripa to kind of not have that happen because they already sold to my youth two times, um, both times vapes. And now they're trying to open up a hookah and uh, bubble tea lounge, which is great. Let's chill and smoke together. Um, so I, they compare, but I don't know how much. They don't really talk to us too much about hookahs. Um, I know they brought it to our attention about that because it's in the vape shop. Um, but I really don't know too much about hookahs. Sorry, Desiree. <laughs> um, one of my questions has to do kind of to the point that you were mentioning how a lot of times when we try to transmit this information to youth, we're met with like dubiousness or like, why would I, you know, listen to you? And so how do we confront that issue? Um, I'm coming from an education space. Um, I've been a bilingual educator, but I also um, now I'm working in this work for Rise Drug Free MKE um, as part of Community Advocates. And I think like, it's so great to see youth doing this work because I feel like a lot of times like peers are gonna listen to peers more than mm -hmm. they are going to listen to adults giving these um, messages especially when a lot of it comes across as like fear mongering or you're just being a paranoid mom and you are, I mean also just like adolescents are gonna kind of like you tell them not yeah. to do something and they kind of get more curious about it. So how do we like combat that? Um, and have you seen, at least in Milwaukee, like is there more um, activities in schools or curriculums around this stuff? Because I was just thinking there's so many ways that we could be incorporating this okay. type of information into school-based projects, into math and data like projects. Like there's so many things that could be done that could be exposing the kids to this information without necessarily just having them sit down and like, you know, shake our fingers at them. Right. Um, so I, I think, I don't know you specifically, but I work with Charlie um, Leonard from Community Advocates. Yeah, she's my bestie. Um, <laughs> so I'm a very honest, like straight up person. Um, so I meet the youth where they're at. Like I tell them, like, I'm not here to be your parent. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I want to give you this information. So like, you know, you know the dangers of it. And I don't really try to talk to them as an adult, like trying to tell them what to do or like trying to tell them, you have to listen to me. I kind of just go in casual and, you know, kind of try to crack some jokes just because I do have clowns, you know, in my presentations that always want to crack jokes and sometimes I'll be like, you know what, come up here with me. You're going to present with me um, since you want to keep talking while I'm presenting. <laughs> um, and, you know, they laugh about it, but I feel like you have to meet them where they're at so they don't feel like you're like telling them like, I'm telling you to do this, and if you don't do this, you know, there's consequences. Um, but I also like to take my teenagers with me to where they do some of the presenting as well, to where it's like it's not just an adult talking to them, but it's someone of their age group talking to them, giving them this information. And they like that more because I noticed that they ask them more questions than they will me. But is this happening in school? Yeah. During Sorry. Is this happening in schools during school time, or is it after school programming? Like, what's yeah. yeah. So right now, um, I've been to two, three different schools. I've been to Cudahy High School, Hamilton High School, and Audubon High School. 
Um, and it was during school hours. Um, I had them do an assembly for each different grade unit to come in and I'll do presentations to each separate grade um, and give them the information. I'm also trying to get a fact group going um, in one of the high schools, just because I'm the only one who does this program, so it's a lot. But um, I am trying to get more into the schools. It's just kind of hard because if we don't have a contact, I can't like directly go to the school. It's like against our contract and stuff. But if I have a contact in the school, I can get a hold of them and then set up a presentation. Um, but it also comes a lot to to where I have a coalition, so we meet once every three months. So it's we meet and discuss like you know what we want to do, how we want to do it, where we would like to go. So like if people would like to join that coalition and you know throw ideas out of stuff we can do or like you know if you guys have contacts of like other schools we could get into, we like to do that as well. Um, just because it is hard to get into schools and to try to give them that information. Um, then about the school policies, a lot of teachers don't know what to do now with vapes. Um, like we've had a lot of them be like, I've confiscated all these vapes. What do I do with them? Um, so I'm working with them now to give them a vape disposal kit. So it's a plastic bucket that has the um, that yellow sticker on there that it says danger. I don't know. I can't think of what it says, but it's for them to collect the vapes. And then once it's full, they'll give it to me and then I'll dispose of it um, for them properly. Cause there's different parts in there that have to be disposed a certain way. Um, and they just, they have a lot of pushback and they're struggling right now because you know, that's not really their area of expertise, you know? They're teachers and they already have a lot on their plates, so now they're like struggling with this vaping epidemic that it's like, we have kids vaping in the classrooms, the bathrooms. They're locking down bathrooms, so like kids aren't able to use the bathroom because of kids vaping in the bathroom, so like that's another problem that they're dealing with because it affects everybody even if they're not vaping. Um, so we're just trying to work with them on seeing different ways um, to kind of fix those problems as well as like alternatives to suspension because if they catch a kid with a vape, they'll suspend them and we don't want them getting kicked out of school either and missing school. So we're trying to find different alternatives to suspension so they're not missing out on school either. <laughs> Sorry, one more question. It's funny because I think this stuff since I started working in um, the prevention workspace, I started getting like targeted ads on Instagram about like their like alternative vapes that are kind of uh, marketed as like medicinal or they're an alternative to vaping that aren't as harmful. Um, there's one like specifically, I get ads for it all the time called like Ripple or something. Um, but I don't know if you have any information of like, is that an effective way for youth to kind of like substitute and step down from their addiction to vaping? Or is that like, is it pretty much just like another form in like sheep's, what, wolf in sheep's clothing? <laughs> that. Yeah, so I don't know too much information about it, but I know from what I've heard with my other partners, it's just another vape in a sense. Like basically, if you want to quit, you got to quit cold turkey. Because if we're being honest, which is hard, but if we're being honest, the products they're giving you still contain some type of nicotine to still give you that type that you're craving to, you know, help you get th through those withdrawals. But at the same time, you, it's supposed to be weaning you off. So it's kind of just pushing them onto another product that then they're going to have to wean off of that product. So it's just like a never ending circle. Aaliyah, I'm noticing the, the time. I think we've got one more one more question. Yep, the virtual participants would like your contact for you to go to their school. So if you could just say it, and I'll type it into the chat. Yes, my like my contact name. Your information, yeah. Okay. It's um, Aaliyah. So A A L I Y A H, and then dot Torres T O R R E S at umos dot org. Do we have time for one more question? Yes. I have more of a statement. Um, we were talking about um, how to dispose of the vape pens. Um, the Terra Deactivation Bags offer that as well. Um, and so they actually dispose of vape fluid. And so Milwaukee County, we always give out the Terra Deactivation Bags. They're in all of our um, vending machines as well. So if anybody's wondering where they can get those from, you can just go to Deterra the activation bag, if you Google it, you can purchase those. It's um, a bag that you literally put whatever, you can do illicit drugs, you can even do medication drugs like pills, and if you add water to it, it'll deactivate the entire drug, 
you seal it up and throw it in your garbage can. Right? So we have a lot of drug, 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 drug drop-off sites, that's great. But um, if we want things in residential spaces like homes, I don't know about schools because I know that there's a lot of legality around that. But particularly, maybe that's an educational piece that folks can have. Thank you, I didn't know that. I want to thank everyone so much for coming today and being part of our presentation. Please stop in the resource fair. Aaliyah has bags, handouts, goodies, all kinds of little things f that are like good, good take homes, uh, good, good little uh, snag bag kind of things. So please make sure you stop in the resource fair and visit her table. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Um, I have some up here. If you guys.